On behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Spokane area, welcome to our 2022 general election candidate forum featuring candidates for Spokane County Commissioner District Number 2. I am Ann Murphy, your moderator, and Mike Bell of the League is the timer. With the redistricting from three to five districts, this is a new district and generally includes the city of, of Spokane, east of Division and Nevada, along with some unincorporated areas around the edges of the city. Voters should have received by now a card from the elections office with your new district number. Only voters who reside in this district will vote for these candidates in the general election. The new maps are available on the Spokane County election site so that you can drill down to your own specific street to see where you are. Election day for the 2022 general election is Tuesday, November 8th. Ballots will be mailed to all registered voters beginning October 19th, and the return ballot must be postmarked or deposited in conveniently located ballot boxes no later than 8 p.m. on election day, November 8th. This forum can be seen as an equivalent to a job interview as you, the voter, learn more about the candidates seeking to hold this office. And you, the voters, are the ones who will be determined by your vote, making your informed decision for hiring your representation when you mark your ballot. Citizens need to register to vote by mail or online at votewa.gov by October 31, 2022, or in person up to and on election day at the Spokane County Elections Office or center place in Spokane Valley. For other questions about casting your ballot or information about candidates, contact the Spokane County Elections Office or visit their website, spokanecounty.org slash elections or call 509-477-2320. Or there's information on the League of Women Voters online voters guide, vote411.org. I'll be asking questions formulated by our Voter Services Committee and will ask as many questions as time allows. Before the questions begin, the candidates will have up to 30 seconds to introduce themselves and tell the voters why they are running. They will have up to one minute to answer each, qu each following question after that, with additional time for rebuttal or follow-up as appropriate. Each candidate will have the opportunity for a 30-second closing. The first speaker will alternate with each question. And so now, to meet the candidates. They are Michael Cathcart and Amber Waldreth. And starting with you, Mr. Cathcart, you have 30 seconds to tell us why you're running. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Cathcart. I'm a husband to an amazing woman, Vina, and a dad to the greatest kid, Atlas. I have the honor of representing Northeast Spokane on the Spokane City Council, where I chair public safety and the Northeast Public Development Authority. I'm asking to be your next Spokane County Commissioner because we deserve a proven and unrelenting advocate who will listen to your needs and fight on your behalf every single day. With your vote, we will commit to preserving our right to live in a safe community, and we will develop a common vision for the future by working across the region to create consensus on our toughest issues. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Waldriff. Hello, I'm Amber Waldriff. I grew up here in Spokane in a working family, and now I'm raising uh, my two daughters with my husband back in Spokane. We live in a beautiful and growing community, but many households are struggling with rising costs and seek greater health and safety. For too long, Spokane County leaders uh, have not worked well with others to get to common goals. And so I'm running to be your new county commissioner with a proven record, eight years on city council, partnering with business and community leaders to come up with real solutions. Thank you. So now please expand or share uh, what training, experience, skills that you have that have prepared you for this new position. Starting with you, Ms. Waldrop, and these will be one minute. Well, thank you very much. Um, part of the uh, experiences that I have is growing up here in Spokane. I grew up in Northeast Spokane, came back as an adult, and for almost 20 years, I've been working to create solutions to our regional challenges. And I've done that working in nonprofit community, eight years, twice elected to the Spokane City Council. And for the last five years, I've worked at the Northeast Community Center. And what I've done there is build upon the work that I did at the city to create strong public-private partnerships. 
So what we've been doing in the Northeast area is bringing together 50 different organizations, schools, residents, to remove barriers to success. So um, uh, increasing access to childcare, increasing employment skills. We've served over uh, 3,000 students in after school and summer programs. And this has come through private and public funds working together to make our community stronger. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of varied background and experiences uh, from working in the legislature and the state senate uh, and seeing how that sausage gets made and how uh, it can really affect local communities and counties uh, like Spokane uh, to working for the Spokane Home Builders. We, we have a big issue right now with development and hous a housing crisis that we have to um, approach very thoughtfully and directly. And so I think I have a lot of background experiences uh, from previous um, uh, work before the city council. But in the last three years, I've been on the city council and I get to chair the public safety committee. I'm chair of the Northeast Public Development Authority where we are working all the, all the time to try and expand economic development opportunities, increase jobs, uh, and really raise up the Northeast uh, part of our community. And so I think I bring a lot of background, a lot of experience, and a lot of talents uh, to uh, address the many issues that we face at the county level. Thank you. So we'll move now to what is top of the news and top of citizens' concerns in this current crisis with managing the various issues related to the unhoused in our community. So what are your views on the county working together with city councils, mayors, to address the homelessness issue in timely, coordinated, and effective manner? And specifically, what actions will you advocate for to address this crisis? We'll start with you, Mr. Cathcart. Yeah. Well, day one, uh, I want to call a meeting of every mayor, every city council, and the county commission. It needs to be a public meeting, uh, and it needs to be a meeting where we start to lay out what those plans are going to be, who is going to be in charge of what, what jurisdictions are going to take over what uh, operations or uh, uh, allow certain resources into those jurisdictions. Uh, to date, most of the resources to deal with homelessness have been in the city of Spokane. And unfortunately, it's also created some pretty negative impacts in the city of Spokane. And so this is really a regional issue. It requires a regional solution. And I believe that we need to see uh, the county uh, play the role of sort of leading these regional discussions. And this applies to a whole host of issues many will probably talk about today, from homelessness to housing to public safety. Uh, and across the board, we can do so much better if we work together uh, across the region. And so we can create incentives uh, to encourage uh, providers to do more on homelessness uh, and to encourage those who are experiencing homelessness to exit. Okay, thank you. Ms. Waldra. Yes, the, uh, the homelessness is really a, it's a symptom of the, our housing crisis. And across the country, you know, we're facing housing shortages and Camp Hope is a symptom of the housing problem that we have here in Spokane. It's really been uh, difficult for me to see that play out this year because it's obviously not a safe manner to house people and it's caused a terrible burden on the neighborhood. The county has not been a leader in addressing homelessness, has not partnered with the cities, um, the state, and we need to do that. So as a county commissioner, It'll be one of my top priorities. Um, I actually think that our nonprofit community and our business community have been doing an excellent job trying to lead in the absence of leadership at the city and county levels. And so I would look to them th to help us shape a regional solution that's going to be successful, similar to what they've done in Houston, where they've had a lot of success. Okay, thank you. So just to follow on this, because you both alluded to this, what actions, priorities do you think are most important to increase the inventory of affordable housing in Spokane County in looking at zoning changes or whatever to might be applicable to reduce urban sprawl and increase alternate housing options? Uh, Ms. Waldrop. So yes, we need more housing. I mean, that's, that's the, the challenge that we're facing, and that's why you're seeing increased homelessness in Spokane. So getting unhoused folks sheltered as soon as possible is a priority. Right now, we don't have enough housing, so we're going to have to be creative about um, sheltering folks in different ways and using different strategies as we build more 
permanent supportive housing. That's really the gold standard for how to keep people housed successfully is the idea of permanent supportive housing. Um, to be able to build more housing in Spokane County, we're gonna have to work and jointly plan. We're gonna have to identify where we have available land. We're gonna have to work between the city and county to figure out where the best density should be and do we have the services and infrastructure to support that. So it's, um, it's a multi-tiered challenge, but I worked on uh, addressing abandoned foreclosed homes when I was on city council and had a lot of success. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, uh, for, first and foremost, just to go back, I, I do wanna just say, I think the, the sheriff's approach to the illegal camp in East Central is, is the right one. It, it has become a law enforcement issue and we need to continue to connect those people to resources, but there are some pretty staggering issues within that camp that need to be addressed immediately. Uh, further on housing, I, I have been glad to champion some pretty big housing reforms in the city of Spokane, uh, BOCA being the biggest, uh, the Building Opportunities and um, Choices Act, and this is allowing for the creation of unique uh, homes within our community that enhances existing zoning uh, so that we can get more units built um, and in a way that actually uh, enhances and improves and expands home ownership opportunities uh, for, for more and more people, which is something that we desperately need because we know that through home ownership and building equity is the way to build wealth and uh, we have got to create more opportunities for home ownership. Across the region, we need to see other jurisdictions coming to the table with ideas on how they plan to expand, and it should be things that make sense for their communities, but they've got to come okay, to the table. thank you, but because I, you both have a lot of experience and, and things to talk about on this, I'm gonna give you 30 more seconds each to put a little wrap up on this. So, Ms. Waldrop, you can have the first 30. Sure, so I think the, the one area that I didn't talk about is that I've served on the Housing Authority Board for the last three to four years. And we're very excited because we have a new program that we were finally allocated called Moving to Work. And it's a great program that allows us to support renters in moving towards home ownership and wraparound services and helping folks be successful and helping landlords um, be accessible to those renters and allowing uh, folks who are trying to get on their feet to have an opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Cathcart, 30 yeah, more and, seconds. And another big change that I think will have uh, a pretty immediate impact on housing in the city of Spokane uh, is modifying our MFTE program, the multifamily tax exemption program, to actually encourage uh, more housing with uh, the, the affordability component and in areas of the community where we might traditionally not see the, that type of housing get built. Uh, so it's really an equity issue as well as one that's going to expand uh, opportunities for housing across the city. And these are things that we should be looking at in all the jurisdictions, and the county can lead those discussions. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to the Board of Public Health. While the organization of the uh, Board of Public Health follows the letter of the law, what changes might you support relative to the size and or composition of that board that would benefit the responsiveness of the Public Board of Health and as part of that, looking at how you would address the health disparities for the BIPOC community that were revealed during the pandemic. And we start with you, Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, I mean, I think the size of the board makes total sense. You just want to have the right people on that board. Uh, and so limiting the, the political aspects to it, I think is really, really good. I have committed to appointing an MD to that board. I know that's something that's lacking and we want to make sure we have a diversity of, of viewpoints and expertise that are represented on the health board. Um, and so if appointed, that would be my choice. Uh, further, I, I believe that the biggest thing we need to do with regards to disparities in our community, uh, first and foremost, is making sure that everybody has access uh, to government. And so language access, broader language access should be something, uh, you know, I've championed this at the city, we've passed it, and uh, we need to do the same thing at the county, but it should also apply to places like the health district and others and making sure that there are no issues with access for anybody in our community. Um, and so that would be the first thing. And then second, we can create uh, uh, task forces and, and groups to focus on, you know, what are some ways that we can outreach to these communities specifically, like the Marshallese as an example, uh, to make sure that they understand the benefits and, and ramifications of various things and giving them access to the programs they need. Okay, thank you. Ms. Waldorf. Well, I had the pleasure of serving on the Spokane County Board of Health for seven years when I was on the Spokane City Council. And I was very proud of the work that we did during that time. Actually, one of the first reports that came out about health inequities 
was um, published during the time I was on the board. And it was the first look at how much disparity we had in um, people um, by race, gender, education, income, zip code here in Spokane. So that was my first aha. And since then, I have been working to try and reduce disparities in first as a city council member, then I helped uh, get the Census 2020 Committee going at the state and uh, here in Spokane, where we focused on making sure everyone had access to fill out the census. And then finally, in the, during the pandemic and the work I do at the Northeast Community Center, we've, um, we've been able to put a greater emphasis on low-income communities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so now moving into our um, legal and criminal justice system, it's estimated that 60 to 70 percent of the Spokane County General Fund is absorbed by the criminal justice related costs. You as a county commissioner will have an opportunity to re-envision law enforcement and the criminal legal system in Spokane County. What would that look like to you in creating a safer, healthier community? We'll start with you, Ms. Waldorf. Well, yes, public safety is the biggest uh, line item in the county's budget. And so how we spend those dollars is critical. And I have three, three things I want to prioritize. Number one, it's very important to have um, sustainable funding for our law enforcement and our courts. Number two, it's important that that funding comes with um, accountability. We need good accountability for our officers, our deputies, and an accountable uh, police force means good trained police officers and it's a sign of a healthy community. Number three, while we need to make sure we fund um, the response we need to crime, we also need to be smart and work towards reducing crime in our community. So we need to invest in programs that are proven to reduce crime. I don't think the county has done enough of this. Investing in community policing, after school programs, mental health and drug courts, the more we invest in these proven programs, the more we improve safety for our community and for our law enforcement officers. Thank you. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. We, we have a right to live in a safe community, and far too many people right now don't believe that this is a safe community, and that applies across the region. And so there's so much more that we can do. I believe that we need to invest in more officers uh, at the county level, get more sheriff's deputies hired. Uh, we do need to change tactics. We need to look at neighborhood policing in the urban parts of the county, um, along with what the city needs to be doing on neighborhood policing. Um, we need to look at how we can better share uh, assets amongst the different jurisdictions, how we can share intelligence. This is a big issue uh, and one that even as few as just five or six years ago uh, had not really improved since 9-11. And so, you know, we need to be thinking about intelligence sharing among law enforcement to make sure that, you know, we know what's going on in the community and can stop criminal behavior before it occurs. Um, and so there's just so much that we can do, I think, regionally, working together cooperatively. And we also need to, to work with the legislature to find more actual courtroom accountability. We need to make sure that those who need to be in jail are in jail and not on our streets, creating more victims. And thank you. And speaking of the jail, you know that many in this community do not support building a new jail. So what are your views and plans to address alternatives to building a new jail, decreasing recidivism, and decreasing the crime rate. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, I mean, I guess I disagree with the, the premise. Uh, maybe you've got some polling data I haven't seen, but uh, from the folks I'm talking to, people are really scared. They're frustrated. They don't understand why we have a revolving door at the jail. People who should be there are not. And victims feel scared, and they don't feel like they're getting justice. And so we absolutely need to invest in a new jail, and not just to increase capacity, but that, of course, does make sense. Our jail is old. We're obviously gonna lose Geiger most likely here in the coming months. Um, and so we're gonna to have to find ways to increase that capacity, but we also need to increase safety. Uh, I think if you talk to those who've worked in the jail um, presently or, or in the past, they will tell you that those narrow corridors are not safe. Uh, and, and frankly, it's not very efficient either because it requires a pretty high number of staff uh, relative to the number of folks that we have housed there. And so uh, we can do so much better with a new facility and that new facility must include mental health and drug treatment. Uh, as part of it, um, but this is going to be something that we're going to have to invest in as a community and find a way to make it work in the next several years. Okay, thank you. Ms. Waldorf. Well, I definitely disagree with my opponent. I do not support um, asking the taxpayers to fund a multi, hundreds of millions of dollars new jail facility 
We haven't fully implemented all of the strategies we can to decrease our jail population and increase community safety. The county is just starting to invest in a supervised release program that will reduce the jail population. It's just starting to divert folks to a new regional mental health and drug treatment center. Um, data shows that during the pandemic, uh, folks who were charged with low-level crimes and were let out of the jail due to trying to prevent the spread of COVID were not more likely to commit another crime. So if our prosecutors can use good data to determine risk, we can hold folks accountable, we can reduce overcrowding, we can cut costs. If voters are interested, I think voters are interested in making investments in public safety, but not in a new jail. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's take a, a little bit of a look now at the, the county commission, the board itself, since it is now moving from three to five. And we know that you have some executive um, authority that is handled through staff at the county level and then your legislative authority. So, and then how decisions are made and with what transparency and input, input from the public is important to you. We know that there's been a director of public policy and community engagement hired. And so what does that community engagement mean to you as you carry out these duties? What would be the best strategies to bring the board input from community members who are not often engaged? We'll start with you, Ms. Waldrop. Well, thank you. I, uh, I can't uh, think of uh, more that we can do at the county. I think that the level of, of transparency and community engagement is very low. I would love to see um, the meetings be uh, more open, the, the, uh, the agendas for the meetings, actually telling the community what's on the agenda and how to get involved. I think there's so many things we could do around that. Um, I also think that the county holds a lot of meetings like the growth management meetings in the middle of the day, which are not accessible to many members of the public. Um, the, uh, the community engagement can come in many ways, but as Mr. Cathcart has said, making sure there's language accessibility is very important in our county with the growing number of folks coming here um, with different language abilities. So there's many things we can do, and um, I'm proud that when I was at the city, we were able to put a lot of information out there at people's hands. The budget, for one. Let's get that on the actual county website. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, first and foremost, every meeting of the county, whether it's of the full commission or a subcommittee, should be filmed, it should be streamed, it should be archived online for folks to find. Uh, the city does this. Um, in fact, it's one of the, the few really positive things that came out of COVID is we were able to make this a permanent change uh, at the city council. And so that's what, something that I want to bring to the county is making sure that all of those uh, meetings are accessible to the general public, that they can find the agendas, uh, that they can see the voting records. Um, that should be something that is just perfectly easily found on the, city, on the county's website for, for all to see. And then we absolutely need to make sure that accessibility is a, uh, a paramount priority. There should be no circumstance that prohibits you from accessing county government or your county officials, and that includes language barriers. Uh, and so just making sure that everybody has the ability to access their county government, their officials, share their ideas. Um, I recall trying to testify on, a, on an ARPA request and was told that they weren't doing testimony on ARPA. And that's the kind of thing that I think we can improve upon. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what other changes might you anticipate in county government now with five, a five-member board? Uh, Mr. Cathcart. Well, I think the way county government is going to operate will be uh, completely different from before because uh, before all three commissioners, uh, when there was three, uh, were elected countywide and really their priority was the county. And I think that that mindset is going to shift a bit now because really the mindset is going to be my district because you're representing a district. And the unfortunate part of that is that there is nobody who is elected at large, uh, whether in, in a specifically an executive position like a mayor or a, a legislative or quasi-legislative executive like a council president or a, a, a county exec of some kind that would sit on the board. And so because we don't have that, there's, there's the real risk that certain parts of our community do not see investment, do not see policies that would benefit them. And that's, that's essentially why I decided to get in this race, is I'm very fearful of being left out of the conversation. Uh, that has happened many times in the past, both at the city and the county level, and I do not want to see that happen again. And so I want to go there to fight for all of East Spokane, and that's a big thing that's going to change. Okay, 
Ms. Waldorf. Well, I kind of have a different viewpoint. I actually think a lot of voices haven't been heard at the county. And with five county commissioners being elected out of five areas of the county, we're gonna have uh, the ability for more voices to be heard in making decisions for all of us in the county, whether we live in incorporated or unincorporated areas. So I'm very excited about the five county commissioner uh, setup because I think it gives more um, fairness and again, making sure all voices are heard. I also think the, the five county commissioner will be uh, much more, it'll allow county commissioners to be able to develop policy better. When you had three county commissioners, two people sitting in a room together is a public meeting. Now with five county commissioners, you can get together with another county commissioner, you can say, hey, how are we gonna address homelessness? Let's get together, let's bring a policy forward, and then you can bring it forward to the whole group. And I just think that's gonna bring forth a lot of new ideas. It's gonna bring forth a lot of great conversation and good, better decisions. Okay, thank you. So uh, one more question before we go to your closing. Uh, are there any other, is there another policy and your solution that we have not addressed tonight that you would like to bring up that you would prioritize if elected? Ms. Waldorf? Well, I was, um, I have a couple of different things I was gonna say, but I'm gonna focus in on, on workforce development. And uh, I, I think right now, when I talk to businesses in the community, when I talk to workers, when I talk to residents, when we have some incredible businesses here in Spokane, that have been very resilient during the pandemic, but they're still struggling. The number one challenge is hiring skilled employees. And businesses can't be successful here unless they have those employees. So I would really like to focus um, throughout Spokane County, our economic development funds on removing barriers for workers to get employed and to obtain the education and skills they need um, to fill the many jobs we have here in Spokane County. And these barriers can include things like what we've talked about tonight, affordable housing. It could, it could be childcare, transportation. So uh, I'm, I really want to focus on supporting people who are underemployed, giving them the opportunity to get access to education and skills so um, we can build those trusted community partnerships. Okay, we'll thank leave you. it there. Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, as I'm doorbelling and talking to folks at their doors, uh, other than public safety and, and often the camp, I would say the biggest thing that's brought up is tax relief. Uh, folks are really struggling right now with the rise in property taxes that they are experiencing combined with inflation and rising fuel costs. Um, I mean, everything is going up and really affecting the affordability of, of not just our community, but, but the entire nation. But here in Spokane and Spokane County, you know, we can control some things like whether or not we're going to take the annual property tax increase. And I am absolutely committed to not accepting that tax increase uh, unless it's on a ballot and the voters say so. Um, we need to make sure if we're increasing taxes, especially at this point in time as we are on the verge of a recession, possibly in a recession, uh, that we are taking that into account and that we're not extracting dollars from the economy that folks need to survive. You know, times are really tough right now, and I think we should focus on resiliency and, and ways to improve people's individual uh, status. Okay, thank you. And now to give you that chance to wrap up, in your closing statements, you will each have 30 seconds, and we'll start with you, Mr. Cathcart. Yeah, my name is Michael Cathcart, and I'm running to be your proven voice on the county commission. If you agree that we have a right to live in a safe community, that working families deserve a shot at the Spokane dream of a safe and affordable neighborhood with attainable opportunities for home ownership, if you agree that resiliency in the face of rising consumer prices, inflation, and fuel is critical, and that working together across the region is the best path for a brighter future, um, and if you agree that county government should be incredibly transparent and, re and ensuring access to all, then I really hope that I can earn your vote this fall. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ms. Waldriff. Thank you, and thank you to the League for sponsoring this forum. As I said earlier, some of my priorities are creating more housing options for all of us to increase the health and safety of our entire community, making sure we fund our criminal justice system and be smart about it. As your county commissioner, I will build on my record of increasing safety and improving infrastructure and together, I know we can create a safer and more prosperous county through regional collaboration and smart, targeted solutions. I would appreciate your vote. And thank you. This concludes our 2022 General Election Candidate Forum featuring candidates for the Board of County Commissioners District 2, Michael Cathcart and Amber Waldrop. 
And now just a few reminders in, in terms of leading up to the election. Be sure to get registered to vote, either online or by mail, or where you find um, people offering that service. Uh, that has to be completed by October 31. Same day registration up to and on election day can be done at the Spokane County Elections Office or center place in the Spokane Valley. Ballots must be will be mailed to registered voters October 19th through 21st and must be postmarked, no stamp necessary, or deposited in conveniently located ballot boxes and voter service centers no later than 8 p.m. on election day, November 8th. For locations of the ballot boxes and other voter service um, centers, contact the Spokane County Elections Office, 509-477-2320, or go to spokanecounty.org elections. Contact information as well as voter's guide can be found on the county's website. Additional information about the candidates can be found on the League of Women Voters online voter guide, vote411.org. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you to our candidates for participation in this forum. We hope this has given you, the voters, information that will help you make an informed decision when marking your ballots by Election Day, Tuesday, November 8, 2022. For more information about the League, visit our website, lwvspokane.org. Thank you.